more classes together. That's kind of sad. Uh, but today, what we're going to do is we're actually going to spend today and Friday talking about kind of the last feature of Java that we'll introduce this semester. Um, the class is wrapping up quickly, which is, which is too bad. Um, I'm going to miss you guys. But we have today, we have Friday, and then there's a midterm exam that starts on Monday. So we'll talk more about that. That's the last CBTF assessment that we have this semester. So next week, we don't really do anything that can be on the exam because there's an exam. So I'll tell, talk a little bit about what we're going to do on Monday and Wednesday. But the material we cover today and on Friday will be covered on the midterm in, in, a, in a sort of a minimal fashion. There won't be a programming question on generics, but there will be some multiple choice questions on it. So you do want to be here and be alert. All right. So but before we get to, to generics, let's finish up talking about hash functions, because I want to, there's a couple of other cool things you can do with hash functions. So I want to introduce you to a little bit of a different type of hash function. So last time when we looked at using hashes to implement maps um, and for certain sort of verification functionality, we had these three properties that we wanted of a hash function. We wanted it to be deterministic. So if I give it the same inputs, it always produces the same output. Um, we also want it to be uniform. So it's going to produce a fixed sized output. You know, these hash values, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, the different size of the hash value or the hash code or just the hash that's produced when I hash content. Uh, Git currently uses, I think, 160 bit hash function. So it produces 160 bits of output, essentially one number that's 100, up to 160 bits long. But in order to have a good hash function, and we'll talk about why this is true in a minute, particularly with cryptographic hash functions, I want the outputs of my hash function to be uniformly distributed across the range. So essentially, sometimes I get a really big value, sometimes I get a really small value. It's sort of random, right? Um, and there's some other properties of good cryptographic hash functions that we'll talk about in a second. But when we talk about using hash functions in computer security or for cryptography, we're actually going to eliminate the last requirement. We don't want a cryptic hash fun function to be efficient. We want it to be difficult to compute. And there's a reason for this that I'll, we'll get to in a second. Okay, so imagine I have a hash function that has these magic properties, expect, except that now it's hard to compute. Okay? And what this means is that it's also, if I give you the output of a hash function, it's infeasible to reproduce the input. That's one of our goals with a cryptographic hash function. This is sometimes referred to as a one-way function, meaning that if I give you the results, you can't invert it and figure out the value that I started with. And this is really important for its use in, in computer security. There's also a really cool connection between the potential existence of a function that has this property that is actually one way and the P and NP problem that we talked about before. Okay? And then the last thing I want, and this is related to uniformity, but the last property of the hash function that I want is I want a small change to the input to produce a big change to the output. And this is actually connected to the first of the two new goals. Okay? So imagine that you're trying to figure out what, I give you the hash code for some input, and you're trying to figure out what input I started with. Well, let's say you guess a few when you look at the, the hash codes that result. If the, if the inputs that are close together produce outputs that are close together, then it's going to be easy for you to figure out, kind of narrow down the range of inputs and start to zero in on what the input was that I used. We don't want that for a good cryptographic hash function. We want it to be one way. So this means that if I take a file, and this is true. This is true for the fu even the functions that, uh, hash functions that Git uses. If you take one of your source code files, and you change one character in that file, the hash value produced by something like SHA-1 or any of the cryptographic, uh, any of the hash functions we've been talking about is completely different. So if I change one character, I get a hash code value that's totally different from the one that I started with. And this is a desirable property, okay? All right. And again, we've relaxed that third requirement we started with, and we actually want cryptographic hash functions to be hard to compute. So a function is the title slide, as the title of the slide implies, that satisfies these properties is known as a cryptographic hash function, okay? And these are so-called because they're heavily used in modern cryptography. 
We're going to talk about a couple of applications of cryptographic hash functions um, in places where you've probably seen them. Uh, they, they're a part of your daily life. You don't realize this, but they get used all the time. Okay. So, let's talk about authentication. All right? So, when you log on to, you know, many of you log on to multiple systems a day, whether it's email systems, uh, Illinois, Illinois' various things that require a password, other tools online that have some sort of account-based system, you know, this is a part of your daily life. And a lot of those are still based, at least partially, on you providing a password. Right, so you provide a password, and the site uses that password to figure out if you are who you say you are, okay? Um, how does this actually work? Okay, so, so here's one way to do it, right? One way to do it would be if, you know, Google or Facebook or Twitter or whatever, somewhere in one of their computers, they had a list of all of your, all of the mappings between your username and your password. They actually had the password sitting there. So when you logged on, you provide the password, you send the password to, you know, whatever external website you're using, and it looks up and it says, okay, you know, foo at illinois.edu, provided the right password, because I have their password written down right here. What's the problem with this? So again, I could, this is sometimes referred to as storing the passwords in plain text or clear text. What is the problem with this approach? It'll work. It'll work great. It's very easy to do, actually. Yeah. Well, so I always have to, yeah, the, the, so the, the, the point is, uh, the transfer across the internet could be compromised. So I'm gonna assume that I have a secure channel between me and the website. That's normally the case. So normally all of your internet traffic is encrypted from your computer all the way to the server that receives it. Okay, so I'm not worried, but that's a good concern, right? I'm not that worried about these being intercepted in transit, okay? What am I worried about? Let's say that Twitter, you know, had a database or a file somewhere where they literally had every user's password in it. What problem could that potentially cause? Yeah, so, so some of you are gonna go off and you're gonna work at some of these big companies, and it actually doesn't even matter. Even if you work at like a small university, people are constantly attacking your computer systems, trying to get in, trying to exploit vulnerabilities. And one of the things that they would be delighted to find would be a file containing all of the usernames and passwords for everybody that used that site, okay? Since now, first of all, they can log on as you to that site and do whatever they want. Maybe that site's a banking website, right? Maybe that site is, you know, maybe they can just cause havoc. Maybe nobody, you know, imagine that I don't know if, if somebody has stolen my passwords and they could use this. But what's the other problem? What's the other thing that a lot of you do that you should not do, that we tell you not to do, but you do it anyway? Yeah. Yeah, you guys reuse the same password on a bunch of websites because it's easy to remember and it's easy to type, and then the problem is as soon as someone finds that password, they use it. What do you think an attacker does when they find a password? They try it on like every banking site that they can find, right? They know what your username is, and they try your password and they're like, oh, maybe they don't know where your accounts are, but it doesn't matter. How long do you think that takes? They probably have a computer program that just does it, tries all these different sites, tries to figure out where can I log in, right? Is there a place where, you know, I can, I can utilize this in a high value situation so I can steal money or, or do something damaging to you, okay? So I don't want to do this. I don't want to actually have to store the passwords in clear text. That's a bad solution to this problem, okay? It leaves me uh, vulnerable to this type of attack. So what do I do instead, okay? What I want is I want a way to be able to check your password without storing the clear text password, okay? And so the way I do this is I utilize this cryptographic hash function that I just discussed. So instead, there is, like clearly, you know, the websites you log into, they need to remember something about your password. If they didn't remember anything about it, you would never be able to log in again, right? But instead of remembering the actual password itself, what they remember is a cryptographic hash of the password. So they take your password, they run it through a hash function, and they save the result, okay? So why is this safe? Let's think about it, okay? 
And then also, how do I use this system to authenticate a user? So when you log in to one of these sites, what they do is they take your password that you provided, they run it through the same hash function, and they compare the results. If the hashed value of your password is, is the same as the hashed value that they have saved, then you must have provided the right password, okay? Now here's the trick. Here's why this is much, much more safe if done properly than saving the passwords in clear text, because if someone steals my database of passwords, the use of a cryptographic hash function makes it extremely hard for them to recover the original passwords, right? Because let's go back to the properties that we are cryptographic. Oh, maybe that's what I'm about to do here, right? So remember, a cryptographic hash function is an instance, at least that we think is potentially an instance of this theoretical one-way function. If I give you the results, you can't give me the input. And it's hard to compute. So if I want to guess, let's say I want to guess a bunch of passwords. So I don't know what the, what the passwords are, but I have the hashes of the passwords, and I essentially want to guess, okay? Well, actually computing the hash code is expensive. So it's gonna cause the attacker to have to devote a lot of computational resources to breaking this system. And remember, the result of the hash code is extremely different even if there's a small change in the input. So the hash code doesn't give me any clues about what the right input is, right? If I hash a value and it hashes to a result that's very similar to the hash code that I'm trying to break, it doesn't matter. That doesn't tell me any information about what the correct answer is, okay? So this is actually how this is done, right? This is done, and there's some other tricks that people play that are important for, you know, improving the security of this type of a system, but this is the basic idea. Okay, so there's a, so, and, and some of these tricks are required to actually make this work in practice, right? So attackers have gotten more sophisticated, computers have gotten more powerful, uh, so just saving the hashes of passwords is not a good solution. And this is particularly bad if your users are dumb and they choose bad passwords, okay? So for example, every hacker in the world knows what the hash code is of password using every possible hash function, right? So if your password is password um, and you end up in one of these data breaches where they recover this sort of thing, you're in trouble, right? That's not hard to figure out. Um, if you want to read more about this, this is actually one of my, my favorite articles ever on Ars Technica. This is, this is old now, it's maybe a decade old, but it's a description of, it was, it's sort of a funny story. I mean, you have to have a certain sense of humor. So um, there was a, sec a computer security company, they're probably gone by now, but uh, they, they were a, a security uh, company, they did some work for the government, and at some point they made noises that they were gonna like bust Anonymous, they knew who the leaders of Anonymous were and stuff like that. So Essentially, Anonymous decided to hack their company, and within a couple of days, had like released all of the emails they'd ever sent, and you know, a, a bunch of, and defaced their websites and things like that. So again, I'm not condoning this type of behavior, but there's a very interesting article about how they did this that's worth reading, right? Because you'll learn a lot about computer security from this, right? And there's some social engineering. There's like every there's there's good examples of every possible security attack technique that were used as part of this, right? Uh, rainbow, pa rainbow tables, which are pre-computed hash values. There was a, a social, you know, a social attack that they use. Anyway, it's a, it's a great article. Go read it. Anyway, okay. So, another example of cryptographic hash functions, right? How many people have heard of blockchain? Okay, how many people have heard of blockchain? Hopefully everybody. Like, it's on, it's an ads on television, right? How many people have any idea what blockchain is? All right, yeah, I see a few of your hands. Um, I'm not sure that the companies that are writing those ads have any idea what blockchain is either. Um, but cryptographic hash functions are a core way of how various blockchain systems work, okay? So one of the things that I need to do in order to create a blockchain system is to be able to verify additions to my blockchain. And the way the blockchain is secured is actually through this really interesting old idea that's called, uh, something that's referred to as hash cash. And there's a link to a description of this. So here's the idea. Essentially, these, these hash functions are one way and they're expensive to compute. And so let's say I want to know that you do a certain, that I wanna force you to do a certain amount of computer work. I wanna force you 
to use a certain amount of computer cycles to solve a problem. I want to force you to make your laptop run for five minutes to solve a problem or to buy some machines on AWS. I essentially want you to prove to me that you did a certain amount of computational work. So essentially what I can do is I can give you a hash, here's a simplified way of how this works. I give you a hash value and I basically tell you, show me the input that produces this hash code with the particular hash function. Well, again, you've got nothing else to do other than guess. So you've got to guess a lot, right? And I can control how much work I make you do by controlling features of the, 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 the challenge, right? And you can read more about how this works online. But the essential, you know, the, the root of it is, I give you a hash value and I force you to produce the input that produces that hash value. And that requires running the hash function a lot and basically just kind of choosing random inputs until you find one that works, okay? Now, here's the cool thing about it. When you come to me and you say, I'm done, right? How do I know, how can I prove that you solve the puzzle? Well, I can just compute, I can take the, res you're gonna give me an input, you're gonna say, this is the input that produces the hash value you're looking for. All I have to do is hash it once, and I can prove that you did the work, right? So in, in blockchain, this is sometimes referred to as proof of work. I have a way, a computational way. This is actually really interesting, right? Until this became a part of blockchain, I don't think people really had an, uh, there was a widespread sense that this was possible. So I can use computers to force you to prove to me that you've done a certain amount of work, computational work, right? Why is this important? Well, that computational work costs money or time or whatever, right? It's not free, right? Your computer was an investment. Buying machines on AWS is another type of investment. This is essentially money, right? So I can force you to spend a certain amount of money to solve a problem and I can verify that you did that. So again, so here's an, you know, here's an example. Um, so basically, Alice tells Bob, here's the hash code that I want you to produce. Bob goes off and tries a bunch of inputs, and then when he's done, he says, here's the input that produces the right result. Alice verifies that input, and you're done, right? The original, um, the original intention of Hashcash, so th this idea came about where people were trying to design systems to fight spam, okay? So here's the problem with email. You know, a lot of you, pr this is, the spam is sort of a solved problem, I think. I mean, we still get some of it, but, um, you know, the filtering and detection systems that we've built have done a really good job of eliminating most of it from our lives, which is a great thing, right? But in the early days of the internet, there's a lot of spam, and it was harder, right? You know, the machine learning data sets that Google has now built up didn't have as many inputs in them, and so they weren't as good, right? But the problem with email is that it's really easy to send email. I can write a little program that sends out, like, billions of emails a day, okay? This is how phishing attacks work, right? They don't have to succeed 10% of the time. They don't have to succeed 1% of the time. They don't have to succeed 0.1% of the time, right? If they proceed, like, if, if they succeed point zero 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 one percent of the time, if, like, if only that percentage of people actually click on the link and do the dumb thing, that works if I can send a billion emails for basically free. It's not free, it's still computer time, but it's not that expensive. So the hash cash idea was, hey, why don't we make it more expensive to send email? So we'll include one of these little puzzles that you have to solve every time you want to send an email. So essentially, the idea is that it becomes much, much more expensive from a computational perspective, to send large amounts of email, okay? This idea was never implemented, but this was the goal, right? This was the, you know, design behind it, right? Now, you know, what's funny about this, of course, is that, you know, people that are trying to buy bitcoins, right? So, you know, if, if you haven't heard a lot about blockchain or about bitcoin, one of the things you may have read is that it, it consumes an enormous amount of power and energy. Because essentially, you have these computers sitting around all the time, trying to invert these hashes. And that costs a lot of money, it produces a lot of heat, uh, it requires a lot of electricity, um, and so this has caused some unintended consequences. I was reading an article about there's some small town somewhere that was close to a, um, it's close to a dam, to a hydroelectric facility. And so for years and years and years, the people that lived there, it's kind of out in the, in the country, the people that lived there had enjoyed really inexpensive electricity because they had this, power generating plant right around the corner. Well, over the past 10 years, they've started to see their electricity rates skyrocket. Why? Because some Bitcoin miners moved into town. 
some serious. They were like, hey, there's cheap electricity here. There's a lot of space. There's like empty factories and stuff like that. So they started to fill these old factories and these old warehouses with computers that are basically doing Bitcoin mining. And suddenly the utility was like, oh my gosh, we have all this new demand for electricity. We need to raise prices, right? And so the people there were, were pretty annoyed by this, right? Um, all right. So, and the last thing I'll say about hashing before we move on to generic. So, so and again, I hinted at this before, but the existence of these one-way functions is actually an open problem, right? No one knows that this is actually, no one has been able to prove that there is an actual thing as a one-way function, right? A function that is essentially easy to compute on every input, um, but ha hard to invert, right? So if you give me the output, you basically have to guess to figure out which input produces. If uh, one-way functions exist, then this would also solve the P and P conjecture. So essentially there's a relationship here between uh, the existence of this type of, pro of, of function um, and you know, the biggest unresolved question of theoretical computer science. All right, any questions about hashing before we go on? This is one of those, you know, this is one of those things that I think you might wonder, like, why are we talking about this? Because this is one of those things that's so powerful, right? Hashing is such a, a good thing to have in your toolbox. You will find yourself using this, right? I mean, I don't write blockchain code, I don't write cryptographic code, but I use hash functions all the time, right? The ability to fingerprint a piece of content in a unique way and use that as an identifier is really useful, right? And you, again, you will find yourself using this in the future. All right. So. Let's talk now, let's shift to talking about Java generics. This will be the last thing we'll do together, uh, today and Friday. So in the past, we've talked about, um, so at this point, you've seen very quickly maps, so you're doing some problems on maps, which is great, and we've seen lists. And I've pointed out multiple times that, you know, if you wanna do some side projects, or if this is as far as you're going in computer science, like these two data structures, a map and a list, will get you a long way. There are, a lot of problems in the world that you can solve just using these two data structures, okay? We've looked at how to implement a list. You guys have actually done that a few times, and we've also very, very quickly looked at how to implement a map, uh, but normally you're gonna use the built-in Java implementations. Now, we've already talked about this before, right? This idea that, so here I have a, a piece of code in our playground that's using both a Java built-in list, an array list implementation, and a built-in map, a hash map implementation, okay? And what we've seen before, so we, we actually went over this quickly, but I wanna review it, is that what happens when you use, so you might hope that you can just use these in a very simple way, right? So I create a list on line eight. List is an interface type, so I'm telling Java I have a variable that's gonna store a reference to a list, and then on the right side, I'm creating a new array list. So I'm choosing to implement the list using an array internally. That's how the array list class works, okay? I can add things to that list no problem, okay? So on line 10, I can add a string. The problem is, what happens when I actually wanna start pulling things out? So if I look at line 11, what's gonna happen, and again, this is, this is review, is that essentially if I create a list in this way, the list is set up to store object references. So everything that goes into it gets upcast to a Java object, which we know we can do because everything in Java is a descendant of object. So object is the one class that it's always safe to upcast anything to, right? So now when I start trying to take things out of the list, I'm in trouble. So line 12 will not work. That's why this isn't compiling. Because what's coming out of the list is an object and I'm trying to save it into a string reference, okay? And there are ways to work around this, right? I mean, I can essentially do this, right? I can put in an explicit downcast, right? And then I can do the same thing with my map. So I have the same problem with maps, right? If you look down here, the portion of the code that starts at line 15 is basically the same. It's just using a map, okay? But all the keys and values that I stick into my maps get upcast to object references. And so anything that comes out is an object reference, okay? So, you know, you can do this. Uh, you don't want to. Um, the problem here is that you are inviting these sort of uh, runtime errors that have to do with downcasting. So let's say that, you know, I thought I was using this 
list to store um, to store strings, and I accident but I accidentally put an integer into it. Okay, so now on line 11, the first thing I put in was the string. The second thing I put in was an int or an integer. That's fine because this can store any object reference. But when I go to get it out, now I'm downcast into a string, and now I have a runtime error. And we talked before when we talked about compilation about a month ago, so let's bring this together a couple things we've discussed this semester, that we don't want runtime errors. We want to, as much as possible, transform runtime errors into compile time errors, because compilation is the thing that we do before we can even run the code. It has to compile before it runs. So that's what we're doing before we run the code. And then after that point, we give the code to someone else and they run it, and any problems that occur at that point are ugly. The program crashes, or it just doesn't do the right thing, or it hangs, or whatever, right? So I have, I have personally lived through a lot of different programming languages in my life. And I will tell you, I have come to appreciate the value of compilers. You know, I, I know a lot of people these days are excited about languages like Python. I've written a lot of Python code, and it's terrifying. Because you can make these type of mistakes, and they can be there for years, hiding in some part of the code that nobody ever uses, right? And then somebody opens the wrong menu, and it's like, crash, sorry, right? Because, the, because there's no compiler, right? There's no one to help you during development to point out, wait, you know, you said that that thing was supposed to store integers, and now you just stored a string into it. That's probably not going to end well, okay? JavaScript has the same problem. Um, all right. So we really want to try to move these errors to compile time. So how are we gonna do this? Java's system for doing this while also maintaining as much generality as possible is this idea of generics. And generics are actually a form of polymorphism. This is sometimes known as parametric polymorphism, okay? What we do is that when we, cre when we create certain types of Java classes, we can tell the compiler more information about what those classes are supposed to do, or in many cases, because these classes are containers, what type of Java objects they're going to be used to store, okay? So here, what I'm doing, you know, and again, you guys have seen this already because we've used this with, with lists, but I wanted to show you the example of maps. So here what I'm saying on line six is I'm creating a list that is going to store integers. So anything I put into that list has to either be a reference to an integer or something that I can upcast to an integer. If I try to put a string in that, it's not gonna work. The compiler is going to tell me that I'm doing the wrong thing. Same thing with my map. So I'm telling the Java compiler, this map is gonna map from integers to strings. If I try to create a mapping that's from a string to an integer, the code won't compile, okay? And essentially, what Java, uh, what Java generics do is they bring together these two nice features of Java, right? So one is polymorphism, okay? Um, you know, we can build general purpose data structures in Java, and we'll, we're gonna look at how to do this, right? That store references to every type of object. So I can build a map, I can build a list, a single implementation of a list that can store any type of Java object. We've already done that, right? And we looked at the map on Monday. Right? But I can also still get type checking, right? So I can still get compile time checking to make sure that I'm using these classes appropriately. All right, so generics are essentially allowing us to still have one list that can store any type of Java object, but also give the compiler a chance to check my use of that list. So here's an example, and again, this is review. On line eight, I'm creating now inside, so now I've got new syntax. Inside these triangle brackets, I have a type, okay? What I'm telling Java is this list variable that I'm creating is going to store strings or something that can be upcast to a string. Don't let me put an integer in there. Don't let me put an object in there. Don't let me put a dog in there or something else. This is a list of strings, okay? Down here on line 16, what I'm telling again is that this is a map from strings are the keys to integers. So don't let me create a map from an integer to an integer or an integer to a string or anything else than a string to an integer. 
Okay, and what will happen here, if I try to compile this code, is now what I'm seeing are, are compiler errors. So the compiler is telling me on line 14, you told me that you were gonna put strings into this list and you tried to add an integer. The compiler is telling me on line 22, you told me that this map was mapping integers to strings, you're trying to create a mapping from an integer to an integer, okay? So I'm getting these compile time uh, checks that are really, really, really helpful. Okay. You guys have seen these, you know, if you've looked up some of the documentation about this, you've seen this system before, right? So here's an example. This is the map interface. Map is an interface in Java that's a parameterized interface or a generic interface. And you see that in the declaration. Those two parameters inside the, uh, the triangle brackets are the key and value that we're providing when we declare uh, the list and use this syntax, okay? So, you know, one thing you might be wondering is why can I still do, if it's so bad, why can I still do this? So, generics were a feature that was added, I think, in, someone was gonna correct me if I'm wrong, which I probably will be, I think it was like Java 5 or 6. So this was not a feature that was part of the original language specification. And so that's why you can still do this. Now, if you do it, you've seen these warnings when you've done some of the homework problems, some of the quiz questions, it says, you know, uh, warning, you know, you're using an unsafe or unchecked operation. And that's exactly right. The idea is the compiler can't check to make sure that you're putting in things to the list according to what you said you were going to do with it, right? So if you use a bare list or a bare map, you miss those compiler time checks. That's why you get that warning. Okay. So what we're gonna talk about, so this is, you know, what else is there to talk about about generics? We're actually gonna talk about how to use them. We're gonna talk about how to use them in our own classes. Okay, so you guys have seen generics. You've worked with them when you work with lists and maps. How do we actually take one of our own classes and generify it, right? Essentially allow it to accept a type parameter. Okay, so we have some new Syntax on our class declarations. I know, you haven't seen a class declaration for a while, right? Maybe that's been a good while, but. Um, so here's how, this, here's how this works. So public class, whatever, we've seen that a bunch of times. This is how we create new types in Java. The, now inside these triangle brackets, I have, I'm indicating that my type class accepts, sorry, my class accepts a type parameter, okay? Now, parameters are different than variables. We're gonna come back and talk about that, right? So essentially, what I'm saying here is that you can create a generic instance, you can parameterize my instance with any Java type. So any Java type can be uh, substituted in there as E. When I do this throughout the declaration, throughout the implementation of my class, I can use E anywhere that I would use a type. So where do we see it here, okay? So here, this is my linked list class, right? So my linked list has had a get function and a set function that allowed me to get and set an item in the list based on index, okay? So now look at my getter. My getter used to return an object. Now it returns a reference to type, the type that the class was parameterized with. My setter is interesting. So my setter still returns void, but over here, in the declaration for my setter, you'll see that I have to call set with an int index and then a value that's of the same type that my class was parameterized with. So this is how you're telling the compiler how to check the use of your class. You're basically saying, if someone creates a simple linked list and parameterizes it with a string, then the reference they get back from get is to a string. And when they call set, the second argument should be a reference to a string. Or again, anything that can be safely upcast to a string. String is final, so that's really only strings. So again, classes, and this is important to understand, so the, the class parameters are not variables. I can't use them like in assignments and things like this, right? Um, I can only, you, you can, they, they really, not a bad way to think about it is basically they're like, this is sort of like creating a Mad Lib, right? Where every place that I see that, I'm gonna replace that uh, parameter with the type that the user provides. So this isn't gonna work. 
So again, this is not a bad way to imagine what happens when the compiler compiles your code, right? So let's imagine that I have this list class that I'm using that has, accepts a type parameter E, and as I just showed you, I'm using that type parameter in my getter and my setter. Now imagine the user creates a list to store strings, okay? This is basically what you get. It's almost as, it's as if you, this is the code you wrote, okay? Imagine I wrote a code to, imagine I wrote a list class that can only store strings. This is how it would look, right? I don't need to do that with generics. I write a generic list class that can store any type of object, and when the user creates one to store strings, they get code that operates exactly the same way as if this is what I had written, okay? So let's look at another example, right? Let's say I used integers, okay? So now I use integer as my type parameter, and here's the list class that I get back, okay? My generic class, a when the user creates an instance of a generic class and provides the type parameter, they get something that essentially behaves as if this is the code that they had written. Okay? Um, I want to point out that this is actually not what happens. Um, Java does something known as type erasure. So actually, there's a really interesting difference. Some of you that will go on and take 225 in a couple of semesters, when you start to learn about uh, 225's template system, you might think about back to Java generics, and Java generics actually work quite differently, right? Um, when the code is compiled, unfortunately, the compiler creates one instance of a generic class that can actually accept objects. The checks are only done when the code is compiled, okay? Um, so that type information you provide is used by the compiler, but then it's discarded when the code is actually run, right? Um, but this model of just taking the type parameter and using it everywhere you see, you know, the type parameter in the class declaration is not a bad way to think about what's happening. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about type parameters. Um, I can accept one type parameter, I can accept multiple type parameters. So I've got an example there, it really depends on your class. So my link, my list class really only has one type parameter that it cares about. It's like, what are you gonna put in here, right? This is a list, it's a linear data structure, right? So it contains one type of object. A map, on the other hand, has keys and values, okay? So it actually has two types that it cares about. So here's a declaration for a map that accepts two type parameters, okay? The type parameter, there are naming conventions for type parameters in Java. You don't have to follow them, but um, it's, it's useful to at least know them because you see them when you start to look at Java documentation, right? So by convention, type parameters are single uppercase letters. This is the only place in Java you can get away with using a single uppercase letter for anything um, and have it be good style, okay? Um, again, if you don't like this convention, do it your way, right? But this is, you know, essentially what you'll see in Java documentation. Um, there are also certain type parameters that kind of have normal meetings. Like E is an element that gets used in lists. You know, anything that has multiple items, E is the element, right? Uh, K and V, you might have already noticed, stand for key and value. So the things that take a key and value, like a map, use those type parameters, right? N is for a number, you know, there, there, are, there are several others, okay? So now let's look at this for a map, right? Let's go back and, and again, we're trying to build up a mental model of how this actually works, right? So here's my map. My map has a key and a value. When I create a map from string to double, it's as if this is the code I had wrote. Everywhere I saw K, I replaced it with the type parameter that the user provided, which was string. So my, um, my getter takes a string as a key, right? Everywhere I see V, I replace it with double, which is the type parameter that the user provided. So uh, get returns a value, Instead of V, I replace that with double, okay? And again, here's an example, integer to string, same thing. Again, this is a good mental model for how these, these transformations actually happen. Okay, questions at this point. This is, uh, this is new, I know this is new, this is sort of heady. We're gonna review a lot of this together on Friday. Um, also take some midterm questions, but any questions about, about generics? Ah, yes, okay. 
So uh, generics, there, there, are a bunch, there are a certain number of gotchas with Java generics. You cannot create a generic array, okay? Uh, arrays in Java are built in to the, to the language, so I can't create a generic array. This turns out to be a huge pain in the, you know, um, in, in practice, right? So think about the ArrayList class. What did it have internally? It had an array. I want that array to store instant references to the type that I provided, but there's actually no way to create an array that has a type parameter. There's a really nasty workaround that you can find if you Google it, but yeah. So, so type parameters only work for Java classes, right? Things that I'm actually declaring somewhere, right? All right, so let's, let's do an exercise here. Let's, so I have here, um, for your consideration, our, this is our linked list class, okay? This is the one that we did together. It's, it's complete. It's correct. Um, but I actually think there's a bug here that we're about to find, which is kind of fun. So, um, so here's, you know, and I can run this and it's gonna do the right thing, right? So it's gonna add some things and it's gonna remove one uh, and then it's gonna get the first element. Okay. What I wanna do is I want to convert this into a generic class. I, instead of allowing it to just store anything, I actually want to track the things that get stored in it using a type parameter. So let's, let's uh, figure out how to do this. So the first thing I have to do is I have to add it to the declaration. I'm gonna use E here because E is for element. Okay, this is a list. All right. Let's look for other places that I'm, so I can use E here. So let's, let's go through and let's see it's, it's almost like everywhere we see object, we're gonna replace it with E. It's not quite correct, but let's, so my inner class item, remember in my linked list, stored an item reference to the next item, but it also stored a reference to the, to the value that was stored in the list. So that reference should now be a reference to whatever the type parameter was that was provided when I created the class, okay? I've also gotta change my, um, my constructor here to accept the type parameter, right? So when I create an item, I need to pass something that's the correct instance. All right, let's go through the rest of this. So this, this stuff's fine. I don't need to change the start of the list. Um, when I add an item, right, the item that I add needs to be the right type, so I'm gonna use E there as well. Um, when I remove an item, the item that gets removed, returned from remove is the, is the, type that I use to parameterize the class. Um, I also use it here, okay? And then my getter, right? So my getter, as we've talked about, returns an instance of whatever the type was that I used to create the class. And my setter takes an index and a reference to an instance of whatever type was used to parameterize the class. Okay, I think this is right. Um, and I don't think there's anything else we need to do here. Um, so for now, ah, okay. This is actually, I think the, I think this is actually the bug. So right now I'm not providing a type parameter in my uh, main method that I'm using to test this essentially, right? And so the question is why is this breaking? So let's go, let's go look at what the compiler is, is uh, angry about here, okay? So, uh, okay, so, so here's, here's one of the problems, like I said. So I would sort of like to allow um, this to take, uh, remember, I have an object uh, array here. So as somebody pointed out, if I try to make this into a generic array, um, it's not, not going to, well, actually, that, that does seem to work. I think I can take a generic reference to an array. I can't create, that's right. So I can't create a new array of a generic type, but I can take a reference to an array of a generic type. All right, so let's look at the other compiler errors that we're getting, okay? All right, and so this one is actually, um, this is actually a bug. So we found a bug in our implementation just by introducing this type parameter. Can anyone tell me what's wrong here? This, um, this class was broken, and we didn't realize it until this point, but there was a problem with my remove method. So what's remove supposed to return? It's supposed to take an index, remove that element, and then return the value of the element, right? 
What is remove actually returning if the index is zero? To return gets set to what? Start, what is start a reference to? It's a reference to an item, okay? So I have, I goofed in this implementation, right? And this is a, you know, generics can also be useful for you helping debug your own program. So what I should be returning here is the value of the first element, not a reference to the item, okay? And I'm doing the same thing here, right? Down here on line 44, um, the compiler is now helping me. Because here's the thing, the compiler now knows that the thing I want to return from remove should be an instance of element, uh, instance of E, whatever the type parameter is. Next is an item, it's not an instance of E, right? And start is also an item, so it's not an in instance of E. Okay, so now I can run this and it works, okay? So first benefit of type, adding type parameters was that it actually, um, allowed me to correct a couple of bugs in my implementation. Now let's actually use it, right? So let's create a simple linked list. And let's have that simple like list store integers. So the diamond operator, which was added recently on the right side, essentially just copies the type parameter from the left side. So essentially, I'm creating a, I'm, I'm declaring a reference to a simple linked list that stores integers. And then I'm creating the implementation of that list on the right side. The diamond operator says that implementation will also store integers. Okay, so let's make sure this works. It should. All right, awesome. Okay, now let's do this. Let's say simple list dot add. Um, let's just make sure that it's gonna check for me and make sure that I can't add a string. And indeed, it does. All right, we'll come back and, and I think we'll, we'll start with this again on Friday. I wanna, I wanna do a couple quick announcements about the midterm. Um, and we'll do some, we, we, I'll take some questions about the midterm specific topics and things like that on Friday if we have some time, which I think we will. Um, all right, so the third and final midterm starts on Monday. It's just another CBTF quiz. It's a little more comprehensive. Um, the focus is gonna be on stuff that we've covered in the last third of class, but essentially at any, this point, anything is fair game, right? There'll be some imperative tasks, there'll be some object-oriented programming you need to do. Um, this is sort of the summative assessment for this class, okay? There are three I'm sorry, the slide is wrong. I fixed it online already. Let me see if I reload it, if I'll get the right version here. Yep, come on. There are three programming problems together worth 50 points. And I think all of them have partial credit, okay? So, and, and again, these are not easy problems. I'm not gonna pretend they are. Um, this is kind of, this is it, right? This is the ultimate chance for you guys to show us what you what you have done in this environment, right? The MP was, was one thing, the final project is another thing. Um, all right. You guys wanna know what's on the midterm? Okay. Um, so we have three programming tasks on the midterm. There is a question on uh, lists, there is a question on trees, and there is a question on sorting. The tree and list questions are very similar to questions you have done on homework problems. The sorting question is exactly the same as a problem you did for the homework, okay? So these are, these should not be difficult for you to prepare for. All right, you guys can start packing up. Let me talk about what we're gonna do for the next couple classes. So on Friday, we're gonna finish talking about generics, uh, talk a little bit about how we can, you know, adjust type parameters and we'll, we'll do some of that. And then we can also do some midterm review. So on Monday, Ben is gonna come in and talk about how he took his final project app for this class and actually turned it into a real deployed application. So I think that'll be fun. Um, Wednesday we do the ISIS forums and sort of talk about how the semester went. So I will see you guys on Friday. Have a wonderful day.